going to just go ahead and jump in. I am uh, Craig Bowser, as Lee mentioned, and I'm going to be talking to you today about DNS. Uh, just all sorts of things about DNS, and it's going to be pretty high level because let's get the share working right. Come on. This, uh, my keyboard decided it just doesn't want to work today. So there we go. All right. So hopefully that is the correct screen. So uh, if not, you'll see all my notes, but nevertheless, it'll be, uh, this will work. So DNS, this is all, uh, DNS is such a fundamental thing about security, uh, but just uh, to tack on to a little bit what Lee talked about, I've been doing uh, security for about 20 years. I went uh, through college on a ROTC scholarship uh, and uh, ended up in the Air Force doing IT stuff. And from there, I got a chance to go and do some information security uh, job at, uh, coincidentally, at uh, Defense Information Systems Agency at DISA. And uh, then after I got out of the Air Force, I started doing network security jobs in and around the DC area. Uh, somewhere in the mid 2000s, I got really interested in what my job was. Prior to that, it was sort of a nine to five thing. You know, you go to work, come home, yay. But then I really started um, going to uh, security conferences, uh, started interacting with uh, security user groups, information security people. I just was like, oh my gosh, there's so much, so cool and just so much uh, neat stuff and just learning. And then I, the bug just hit me and now uh, I just do it 24 seven almost and um, balancing uh, life, life work balance is so important. And so that's been a lot of challenge and like so many people said before that, it's a constant learning, but a constant effort to balance uh, the things that you're learning and the things you're doing uh, with just maintaining life, being healthy, family and friends, and uh, just focusing on yourself as well. So I presented at a number of conferences uh, as well, and I do a really poor job of blogging, but they, I occasionally do get to do that. So let's jump in. Uh, so. DNS, this is such a core thing. And what is DNS really? Well, to kind of set the stage for what DNS is, some of you may know a lot about this and some of you may not have heard about this at all. And to set the stage, you know, let's just talk about ancient times. I mean, you know, back in the late eighties and nineties and even before that, right? Um, you know, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you had to use one of these devices and you had to, actually call them. And how did you do that? You had to remember their phone number. And so if, you know, those of us who grew up in these times, I remember my best friend's phone number still 30, 35, 40 years later, I remember that number, uh, like the back of my hand. I remember the number from my parents' house. I remember the number from my grandparents' house, because you dialed these all the time. If you didn't, um, if you, if you didn't have it memorized, you may actually have had a piece of paper next to the phone, right? Because back then the phones were, were corded. That means they were attached to the wall. And so the, there was a bulletin board next to the phone that had all these numbers that you called, you know, that were important. Uh, maybe the fire department or the police department because not everywhere had 911. And so you wrote those numbers down. Uh, and then for those occasions where maybe you didn't have the number memorized or perhaps um, you know, you, uh, it wasn't written down. Then you actually had to use one of these as a phone book. You had to look the number up. Maybe it was the white pages for people or the yellow pages for business. Why? Because we're, we could memorize a certain amount of phone numbers, but we couldn't memorize, you know, everything. And so we just, you know, we had to look these things up and the phone only understood a number. And so what happened? Uh, we moved into this era of smartphones and, now we don't need to know numbers. We just need to know names. We're really good at remembering names. We remember, you know, all the names of, you know, our classmates and our, our, you know, our parents and our family. And so what? 
uh, now we say, if we want to call somebody, we say, hey, Alexa, or hey, Siri, call, you know, so-and-so. Uh, and the phone does that translation from the name we remember into the number that it dials. Uh, we scroll through our address book and we do that same translation. It translates that name in our contact list to the number that it dials. Or we Google uh, the business and we click and it translates the name that we click into the number that we dial. So what happens now when we have computers, right? So back in the day, how did one computer talk to another? Well, if I had my computer on here on, on, on one side of the screen and I wanted it to talk to the computer on the other side of the screen, well, we had to use, initially we had to use this device if they were in two physically you know, separate states or separate cities. But what happens if those things were in the same room? Well, what do we do? We then we then connected them directly with a, a network cable and we used IP addresses. The number that these assigned to one computer, we say go this number, one, two, three, four, go talk to that computer on that number, nine, eight, seven, six. And now those machines communicated over this network cable, this ethernet cable, uh, knowing these numbers. Well, just like with the phones where we, you know, where, where if we had to call our best friend or our parents or our grandparents, right? We could memorize a few numbers. And so when there were just two computers, okay, that's great. I can memorize the num those IP addresses for two computers or four computers or maybe eight computers or maybe 16 computers. I'm still not doing bad. But what happens when there's more and more and more computers? Oh my God. I I can't remember, no one could memorize that number. So what happened? Well, eventually they started coming out with directory service. So Elizabeth Fenier, and I'm probably butchering that name, you know, was one of the first people to create and start the maintenance of directory servers that was taken over by John Postal. But even that directory service, that, that text file, that file of that matched names, where we assign names to computers to those IP addresses, that that file grew too large. We're, we were getting more and more computers back then, right? You know, and you know, I know it's hard for some of you guys to imagine now, but you know, there was a time you could count on two hands. You could maintain a, a simple text file of how many computers back there. But eventually that, like I said, that file got too large. So now DNS is comes into play. DNS was first established in 83 with RFCs 882 and 883. And it's been around for that long. DNS is essentially the phone book of the internet. It is how we take today the names that we type in to web addresses and it translates it to those IP addresses that the computer understands how to make the connection. And so this translation that was initially done by just a text file maintained by those two people into the automated versions that we have now through the RFCs, through the uh, uh, application called Bind, which was first set up in 85. All of this uh, came to place back in the mid 80s and it's remained largely unchanged since then, right? This thing that's fundamental to how the internet works has been running the same way for 35 years, all taking place over port, uh, you know, 53. Well, how does this work? What is, what's going on behind the scenes that you and I, we don't think about because whether we're users, where we're just typing on our laptops, typing, you know, click tapping on our phone or administrators who are main managing the networks, DNS, for the most part, absolutely just works. So what does just works mean? Well, if I'm the computer here down on the bottom and I wanna to go to www.company.net, I type that in. Well, as I said, the machine doesn't know what www.company.net is, they need a number. So it makes a DNS query and says, hey, DNS server, what is the IP address of www.company.net? And so that first DNS server says, "May if it knows the answer, it'll respond back. But if it doesn't, it goes and makes another query up, up into a hierarchical, into a hierarchy of DNS servers. 
And so this hierarchy is what enables DNS to be scalable across and around the world in a very, uh, while a very simple tiered structure of server and clusters of servers, but it's very um, complex in how it manages a, a load balance that, where queries can number in the billions of queries per, and answers per day. Um, so now once that query is made, if this cluster of servers at, you know, sometimes at the top level domain uh, part of the hierarchy, if it doesn't know, it says, hey, root server, which is the, the fundamental bottom uh, top level that says, that kind of manage the, the entire structure of DNS. What is, you know, he says, do you know the IP address of www? www.company.net and that root server says I don't but I do know that these people over here they probably do so now I ask them and they say well no I don't know but I do know that this group of servers does and that group says yeah I know so now what we have is the original DNS servers is the resolving server that's doing the resolution the way that is where I translate the um, web address into an IP address, the resolution. Um, and I have now gotten an answer from the authoritative DNS server. That is the DNS server that knows the answer, that has the answer. It says, yeah, I know the answer. And I've now replied back to the resolving server. And that resolving server finally tells my computer, hey, this is the IP address, and now my computer can actually make that connection and goes to www.company.net. And you think that's pretty complicated. How long does that take? And it takes milliseconds, generally. It's very, very fast and very efficient and happens at a huge scale across the internet. And it happens so efficiently and so regularly that we don't even really think about it. So who uses or what uses it? I mean, pretty much everything, streaming, gaming, music, connections, your cell phone with Instagram and Snap, all of these things, every one of these absolutely uses uh, DNS, whether you know it or not, it just does it under the hood in the background to make all the connections and chain, exchange all that data. Well because DNS is one of the fundamental structures, it is actually a very big target for hackers, for attackers. And so how, what are some ways that these attackers take advantage of DNS or uh, subvert DNS for their own purposes? Well, one way is when they actually target and compromise uh, a computer, one of the ways that they know that they have compromised it is that that computer starts beaconing, starts signal, signaling back over DNS. And why do you think that attackers use DNS? Who's going to block it? Didn't I just say that all of those things, everything in that last slide, plus ever, almost anything else you can think of uses DNS? Exactly. No one's going to block DNS, so why not use it for your own nefarious purposes? So I, so attackers get in there and use software that beacons out, that signals out the over DNS uh, to say, "Hey, I this this malware, this this um, virus has taken over this computer and it's waiting." Uh, I want to let you know I've taken this computer over, and, <clears throat> computer over, and I'm waiting for you to give me further instructions on what to do. Another way is I can I can use or an attacker can use DNS to control what you see. Remember, we talked about how DNS does resolution of web of 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 web addresses of 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 internet domains and such. Well, what happens if I tell you where that resolution is versus the real answer come back, comes back. So if an attacker is able to poison 
the answer. And they can do that a couple ways. One way is a DNS resolution server. If it gets an answer for a particular website, if it says, oh, I've got the IP address for the www.company.net. Well, instead of, um, instead of making that query every time, I'm going to store that IP address in my cache for a certain amount of time. And that way, if someone else asks me, I don't have to go ask someone else. I have that information already. Well, if an attacker can poison that cache, can overwrite that cache, or an attacker can give the answer before the authoritative server can give the answer, then I can control where you go. So now if you ask me for www.company.net, but I, and instead of getting the right answer, I give you the wrong answer because I want you to go to my bad site. I now control where you go and you don't know anything different. So cash poisoning and poisoning of, of answers, another way attackers um, can you know leverage DNS. They can also um, uh, flood, you know, a simple just DOS attack, um, denial of service, where they can drain, you know, use up all the resources. Maybe I make too many queries to a particular DNS server. Maybe I can, um, you know, maybe I can use other ways to just make your particular DNS server unresponsive. So I can drain this, the queries for your particular one, or in a broader sense, I can bring down an entire cluster of servers. We talked about, remember the root servers that were up top? Well, those root servers isn't just one or two servers, it's hundreds of servers that are all clustered together. Or maybe the servers that are responsible for the .com uh, group of addresses. So all the top level domain .com, maybe I just, maybe attacker targets them with a denial of service. One easy way to do that is by sending out a very small query, a DNS query, that brings back a very large answer. Reflective attacks uh, are a way to, to leverage uh, asynchronous ability to uh, make, by spoofing my source address, I say, hey, I'm making a very small query about this particular DNS and respond, but it's gonna respond over there because I've spoofed my source address as that person. So now I have a very large query and if I do this hundreds of times because of maybe as an attacker i have a botnet so i have i get all of my botnet to make this query with the source address of this poor defenseless dns server or cluster of dns servers over there and it just floods that dns server and shuts it down this has happened a couple times and a lot of times we think oh the the internet's down oh the internet's not really down but your dns server that you need to use is just swamped and can't respond. And so now it's down. So the last one, the last way I'll talk about is we'll go back to this illustration is not only can I use uh, a malicious computer to signal to beacon out, but I can also use it to extract, to exfiltrate data. I can, you know, use specially crafted DNS queries and responses and traffic to actually send out the contents of files and information within your network. And again, all of this happens because of, I am not going to block as a company, as an organization, as a ISP, I'm not blocking DNS. I can't because everything depends on DNS. So how do we protect our DNS? How do companies go around and protect DNS? Well, they, we split out the resolve, resolution and the authoritative DNS servers. And real simply, that means, remember when I talked earlier about how we have a, a server that does the queries to find the information that does the resolution of an actual uh, domain name to the IP address? Well, we can use, we can take a server that only does that. And then we can have our authoritative server over here that has all the information, that has all the uh, um, the golden ticket per se, the um, the confidential stuff that we don't want anyone to actually know or change. And so 
this server separate and we uh, have extra protections on this authoritative server. We protect this one too, but we kind of ramp up the protections for the authoritative server. We, on our network, we make sure that we only have allow traffic that is using our DNS, not, um, not someone else's DNS. We patch our servers, uh, we patch our applications. We limit access to those servers to only authoritate, um, of authorized personnel. And then we make sure that that authorized personnel uses strong authentication, two-factor even if we can. Ultimately, we wanna monitor our DNS and traffic. Um, you know, I think about some of the folks that remember we talked, uh, Tyrone talked about the security onion. You can use security onion to monitor your traffic or other, um, other monitoring software that allows you to look at that traffic. And then we can use DNSSEC. What's DNSSEC? Well, I'm glad you asked. So we're going back to a little bit of this example. DNSSEC really just allows that information that's exchanged between DNS servers to be um, cryptographically signed. That means if any information that is sent between DNS servers that have DNSSEC enabled, is signed in such a way that the person uh, that the server receiving that DNS information is sure that the information was not changed when it was sent, nor was uh, is it, I'm sorry, it, the DNS server that receives the information is confident and is sure that the information was not changed and that the source of that information being sent is valid. This is sort of like getting a postcard in the mail and looking at whoever signed the postcard. It's like, oh yeah, I recognize a signature. I can verify that that signature is my cousin Bobby. And I know that nothing was changed on the postcard. Now, what's the problem with the, having a postcard, even though you can validate that it was not changed and that you know it was sent from? Everyone can still read it. Let's talk about privacy. DNS has some privacy, uh, privacy problems. Why? Because everything's in clear text, which means every time you go and make, uh, let me just back up for a second. Every time you go and make a DNS query, because every time you make a connection, whether it's to a web page or to a snap, to Insta, whatever you're doing, you're making DNS queries. Every, all those DNS queries are in clear text. What does that look like? Here's the DNS query um, that I sniffed off the wire, off my, you know, it in, in my in my house. Where do you think that this connection was going? Where was I trying to get to? Well, right there, YouTube. It's plain and simple, right off the wire. I can easily read that. I can tell you what IPs that this ant that, that was resolved and that we made these connections. Well, that's definitely a challenge. It means anyone watching any of the data that's being sent between the computers for DNS traffic knows what you're doing, what sites you went to, when you went to them, and probably what you were doing on those sites. And this is a challenge, especially for places like that are, uh, are people that are in, in uh, perhaps I should say oppressive regimes uh, in various places around the world. And um, not only that, but here in America, even commercial interests use these to uh, track where you're going, what you've done on the internet, what you're buying, what you're not buying, what you're interested in. And all of that information is very obvious. So what are some things that are coming up to, or they've come up with? They're looking at two different technologies, DOT and DOH. DOT is DNS over TLS. And so this uses port 853. It's available right now in Windows 10. It's used if you have an Android phone. Uh, the more recent versions is probably enabled already. I, um, and so this is one method to, uh, for DNS encryption. Another one is DOH. And uh, the advantage with DOH is that it uses port 443 with TLS. You say, why is that an advantage? Well, what else uses DN uh, port 443 with, DNA, uh, with TLS, pretty much everything you do on a web browser that's encrypted. You go to the bank, you go to um, Gmail, you, you know, whatever you're doing that has HTTPS, 
it's using the DNS um, port 443. So if I use DOH, it's, ver it's much harder to block or to, uh, to identify as opposed to DOT, I just block port 853 and instantly um, uh, I have prevented anyone from using that. Uh, there are some ways to block DOH too. There are other issues, DOH for instance, or DOT, uh, but much more so DOH, which is much more uh, enabled at the moment is not a panacea. There are multiple ways information leaks about your session to say nothing of the actual session. Maybe your DNS is encrypted and I don't know where, what site you asked for, but the minute you switch over to going in a browser, all of that information is not encrypted and I know where you went. So there are some issues with that. Also, you know, if you have, um, if you're using in the US, all the uh, DNS traffic that you've encrypted, well, that's going to commercial providers such as Comcast or Verizon or Google or Cloudflare, and all of those are subject to national inquiries. Um, so, whew, with that, <laughs> that is a whirlwind. Uh, and so I definitely can take questions from here. Uh, Lee, if we have any or... <clears throat> oh, there's a few, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. If is DNS hacking the most common way of hacking a computer? I mean, I, I think I can kind of answer that one anyway, but just interested to get your thoughts. Um, so, no, it, it's not. It's it's definitely not. It is a uh, um, it, it's it's a tool in the toolkit for uh, for attackers, uh, but it is not probably the most common, and it, it is. Um, Monitoring DNS is probably is one of the most important things you can do if you're a blue team, if you're a defender. Uh, it is definitely easy to find easier to find indications of compromise IOCs with DNS traffic, uh, but it is not by any means the most uh, common way. Okay, so if you're using something like Cloud Cloudflare or another DNS caching site. Um, what potential issues does that play? Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, and mostly with Cloudflare, what you're subject to is, uh, as I mentioned with DOH, uh, the fact that just because you're using that doesn't mean that you're protected any more than not using it as far as privacy. Uh, also understand that it's... Um, that using it, uh, like some people have said before, if if, if it's free, you're um, you're not you know you're the product, right? So if the product is free, that's not really it. You're the product. So they're using your information for other reasons. Uh, now there are some benefits, and so that's always a cost a cost benefit balance you have to make. Uh, the biggest thing is really understanding that. They, um, they do provide extra protections against uh, malware. They do provide extra protections against phishing um, and such things as that. Uh, and so there are some good reasons to use uh, cloud services such as Cloudflare for those reasons. Among others, it's really easy to number to memorize if you're trying to set up DNS. Okay. Uh, in terms of the more secure versions of, of DNS, why is it that we don't have like a single standard? And then what are potentially some of the drawbacks that we have from using encrypted rather than just standard DNS? Right. So the uh, biggest, uh, so between the two main uh, version, uh, main options right now, that is DOT and DOH, uh, the drawbacks for DOT are that it, um, while it may provide a more uh, privacy, it's easier to block and detect. And so if you're trying to use DNS uh, in areas where you really want privacy, such as oppressive regimes, it's so it's completely easy for them to block it and then you can't use it. So 
that's one, you know, the drawback for there. And I, I mentioned that a little bit. And then also with DOH, the biggest drawback is that it is not, uh, there's a lot of pushback because it is not as secure and not as confidential as it could be. Uh, and that, that issue, um, 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 that, that kind of issue that a little more detail than we have time to go into in this talk. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much.